welcome to my presentation. Today I'm going to be presenting on same-sex sexual violence and protection. So just a bit about myself. My name is Rabia. I work for an organisation called Child Hope. Child Hope is based in the UK. However, we work in Africa, Asia and Latin America. Um, my role within Child Hope, I'm a Child Protection, Safeguarding and Participation Manager. Uh, however, I have 12 years experience of working with children and young people um, across the world. In terms of my qualifications, so my background's in informal education, youth work and community work, social anthropology, and I have a master's in childhood and youth studies. So my experience, I've worked in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Africa and Latin America. To safeguard myself and organisations, I will try to avoid using country specific examples as um, this is a, a sensitive topic. Also, I'll draw on my experiences over the past 12 years. So the protection problem, there's been growing focus on child sexual exploitation and abuse globally. However, this mainly focuses on older males abusing girls and women. Um, and I suppose to some extent, uh, Save the Children's recent report, No One to Turn To, also is an example of that. Um, and I suppose we need to, we also do need to recognise that girls are abused um, more than boys. Also, I just want to acknowledge that there is also a trend of women abusing boys. However, because both of these fit into a heteronormative uh, framework, um, they're kind of discussed a bit more and a bit more acceptable. However, one of the challenges I faced as a practitioner is around uh, same sex sexual violence um, with males and boys. So I suppose I wanted to discuss this because I think it needs more exposure. Also, um, I just want to share my experience of uh, some of the challenges when dealing with uh, protection around same sex sexual violence. So the two trends I suppose that I've noticed as a practitioner is adult to child sexual abuse and peer on peer sexual abuse. So with regards to adult to child sexual abuse, uh, some of the places or spaces uh, that the abuse happens is um, it could be a family member or someone known to the family, so the family friend, um, also on the street, so people who inhabit the streets or uh, street connected people. Um, boarding schools, so this could be normal schools, but also in a lot of contexts, there are also, um, they call them special schools, so schools for children with disabilities. Also places such as reprimand homes, care homes and orphanages. Um, and another place is employers, so uh, that could be children working in dump sites, children who are slaves, domestic workers, um, etc. So with peer on peer sexual violence, um, these, this usually takes place in care homes, reprimand homes, orphanages, boarding schools again and on the streets. So in, in the case of peer on peer abuse, what's really interesting is that a lot of uh, the boys who abuse younger boys um, have usually been abused themselves. So working with uh, street children, for example, um, you have a boy who is street connected, he's abused on the streets, then um, he becomes an elder, he's also a carer for um, younger people who are on the streets and uh, the carer also becomes the abuser. Um, so this is something that hurt has been quite common when working with street children. 
As a practitioner, I want to share the protective mechanisms that I use in order to protect children at risk. The Child Rights Convention. So as a practitioner, I usually use the CRC as a way uh, to facilitate intervention and justify uh, the child protection responses. So these are just some of the articles that I've previously used when responding to sexual violence. Uh, also, the Child's Rights Convention is embedded in um, most organisations policies as well. So it's used as a framework to protect children and their rights. Another framework that I use is keeping children safe. So KCS set um, the global standards for safeguarding. So again, um, their standards I've used in terms of ensuring that there's safe policies, people, procedures and accountability. Um, and again, they have specific principles that are embedded into uh, child protection policies to ensure that children are protected and the best interest of the child is thought about. So while uh, all countries are signed up to the Child Rights Convention, uh, except for America, um, one of the things I've found as a practitioner is using the CRC um, to facilitate intervention can sometimes put the child at further risk as the CRC can conflict with local laws, especially laws around homosexuality. Um, and this doesn't always give uh, space to protect children. So using the Child Rights Convention to protect children who have been sexually abused by the same sex can be problematic because of laws around same sex relationships. So obviously this is something that is always changing um, in terms of countries changing the legal status around same sex relationships. So it's always being negotiated. Uh, however, I just wanted to present um, some of the countries that have the death penalty or life imprisonment. So in some cases, it becomes highly problematic to try to protect the child when it has been same sex abuse. Some of the risks when dealing with same sex sexual violence um, in countries where the laws conflict with the Child's Rights Convention are physical violence or death. So children are subjected to physical violence by community members and family or mob beatings. Um, they become physically displaced. So family members or, or peers disown them from uh, their protective environment um, and they're chased out of community. So children can be humiliated, shamed and face stigma around this um, and legal systems as well. So where it is illegal in certain countries, there are penalties of death or imprisonment. So the survivor <laughs> um, then becomes uh, subjected to further violence by the state. There's also other areas. So. Um, the loss or potential loss of protective system. So as I said, if you're on the streets and your carer is also your abuser, you then lose your protective systems um, and maybe you, uh, there's more vulnerability there. Uh, also significant harm to emotional and mental well-being. So to try to manage this dichotomy, um, I'd like to introduce you to do no harm. So Do No Harm was um, initially used by doctors. Uh, however, Mary Anderson in the 90s uh, developed this into a framework to analyse context uh, where there's conflict. So she developed a framework to further analyse the impact of interventions. Um, and this has been used further by the humanitarian aid organisation. So say, for example, SFIA, they've used it as a principle. So ensuring that whatever you do, first of all, you do no harm. 
and you avoid exposing people to further risk, which is something that hasn't always been done by development agencies. However, it's slowly becoming popular. So in the UK, we're seeing with DFID, for example, they're now asking um, how organisations are doing no harm. So this is forcing agencies to some extent to start thinking about the do no harm approach. However, it isn't something uh, explicit explicit within development organisations and it's slowly starting to be discussed. So do no harm principle in child protection clearly forces you to reconsider your intervention as all actions taken should do no harm to children. So these are just some of the areas uh, that uh, charities or development agencies should be thinking about when working with children, um, how they can do no harm. So do no harm in child protection also forces you to think about the protective layers um, as well. So doing no harm to the protective layers that uh, protect the children or the child. So say, for example, the family, the community, the child's peers um, and even institutions. So at all levels, you should attempt to do no harm to uh, any of those layers. So this adds a new complexity um, to dealing with sexual violence um, against children. So say, for example, um, where usually if a child was abused, maybe you would work with the family to ensure the child is further protected. With same sex sexual violence, this can actually have a negative impact sometimes as the family may react um, and the child could lose its uh, protectors, so the family. Also, another thing, as I mentioned, is peers. So, um, a large uh, number of children are protected by their peers. So if you are on the streets and um, you address the issue with the peer, you've now got the situation where the peer uh, so um, is now at risk and the child is still at risk. Um, and in some cases, um, there's even situations where both uh, both the abuser and the survivor are then forced out of community or beaten. Um, so how you engage with those layers is really important and um, the risks need to be thought about all the time. So recently I had um, a few cases uh, where children um, Actually, there were two separate incidences where a child uh, had been abused on the streets by a peer. Um, and then I had a separate issue where a child was being abused by his uncle. Um, and I suppose as a practitioner, I wanted to share knowledge or try to find organisations that could provide guidance. And I was quite surprised to find that there isn't that much information out there or it isn't in a centralised place. So through speaking to networks and contacts, I was able to find two leading organisations. So one was Mencare and one was Promundo Global. Um, and I contacted them just to get some guidance. However, it, it really highlighted the gap um, of getting guidance around this area um, and just trying to ensure that you're not putting young boys uh, at further risk. So I believe as a practitioner that um, there needs to be a call for action. So more protection organisations need to work collaboratively. Um, I believe that if we develop some sort of global working group or network that could guide or share best practice of dealing or working with sexual violence, that would be amazing. Um, also, another area is data collection. So um, obviously, organisations are all collecting their 
own kind of data around uh, protection issues. However, if there was more collaboration in terms of understanding um, what is actually happening to boys, what are the patterns, what are the trends, are there people or certain boys more at risk than others, that would be useful. Also, um, sharing knowledge and learning of different contexts. So as a child protection practitioner, I develop, I've developed portfolios around protection issues and I try to use uh, certain tools to do further analysis or collecting data on what learning there is or how to develop that. So if there was more collaboration with uh, protection organisations to share that data, maybe uh, that could enable other organisations to improve uh, certain protection systems. I also feel there needs to be some sort of shift in guidance theory and or language. So um, more incorporation of do no harm principles into policies um, and child protection agencies approaches. Um, so as a consultant, I develop protection policies for various INGOs in the UK and uh, do no harm isn't really in uh, protection policies that I've seen in the UK or it's not uh, really addressed because it doesn't really follow the UK guidance on child protection. Um, and again, this is where uh, there needs to be clearer guidance maybe within international development um, uh, standards around child protection. Um, the other thing uh, I think is around inclusive approaches. So sexual violence is <laughs> quite gendered. So um, I attended uh, Angelina Jolie's Global Summit to End Sexual Violence and actually there was only one organisation from DRC who was presenting on men. So I think there needs to be more of a gender neutral language around sexual violence or sexual abuse. Um, Whilst I recognise uh, girls and females are targeted more, I think we need to think of sexual violence as an umbrella term and look at um, other case studies around boys or children with disabilities because actually these, these are cases that are happening but are not discussed um, and are quite taboo. So I think this discussion needs to happen um, and we need to address this. Um, as we know, it happens everywhere globally. It's just not really discussed. Um, and then I suppose one of the last things I thought about was around uh, programmatic focus around um, health and relationships. So some of the organisations I've looked at, like Promundo, they mainly look at uh, health or healthy relationships. And I think this is something we really need to start focusing on is uh, not only just thinking about blame, um, it, it's thinking about peers who are abusing peers, like how do we get them to deal with the trauma that they've dealt with? How do we get them to think about uh, imagining healthier relationships? Um, and being okay with their sexuality as well. So I suppose um, it is an interesting space for child protection agencies and there's a lot of space, I suppose, for organisations to collaborate and be creative with dealing with this issue. So I'm ending my presentation here. I want to say thank you for listening to this. Um, this is my subjective experience as a practitioner. However, if you'd like to get in contact with me, please feel free to email me. Thanks. Bye.